everyone to today's session of Glossary Science Contemporary Debate. And it's my very great pleasure and honor to introduce today's speakers, Professor Nancy Cartwright from the University of Dara, the University of California, San Diego. Um, Nancy um, works in philosophy and history of science, and more recently she's been working with the inferences and evidence-based policy and philosophy of medicine. Um, she has written lots of books, so she's really shaped the field over the past 20 years or so. So just to mention a few of her books, How the Laws of Physics Lie, 1993, Nature's Capacity and Their Measurement, 1999, The Double World, 1999, um, Evidence-Based Policy with Jeremy Hardy, 19, and, uh, sorry, 2012. Nancy is a fellow of the British Academy, a member of the American Philosophical Society, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Gen General, sorry, the Gen German Academy of Sciences. I'm going to start by telling a short story about the Bangladesh Integrated Nutrition Program um, that uh, failed. And it was based on, I'm going to tell you the short you know, pastiche story. It was based on an integrated nutrition program in Tamil Nadu that had succeeded and that had very good um, evidence that the program itself had contributed to increasing um, uh, nutrition in new mothers and young children. Um, the, the nutrition program um, aimed to provide nutritional education for expectant and new mothers because the idea was that with the resources already available, if children were fed differently and actually the mothers act differently um, during pregnancy, um, uh, children would be much healthier and better nourished. Um, and this, there, there were a lot was going on in Tamil Nadu, so it was an interesting um, issue about how to provide evidence that this program in particular had had a positive effect, but pretty satisfactory because it was not so controversial that, um, that it did. And then the program was tried out in Bangladesh and, um, and it didn't succeed. Um, and the, I mean, I can tell you the, the punchline, uh, and then we'll come to the analysis of it. Um, what was happening, uh, a post-token analysis um, by uh, the uh, World Bank was that, um, I was actually hard white who did it, um, was that what was wrong in Bangladesh were men and mothers-in-law. So in, Banglad in, in Bangladesh, um, in general, in the population uh, where the program was tried out, uh, men do the shopping and mothers-in-law do the food distribution. And the mother has no say whatsoever in anything. So educating the mother, uh, who was at any rate afraid to say anything when she went home, uh, even though she was, uh, had took the, the child's interest as paramount, um, she was not able to put this knowledge to use. Um, so what was happening was that in, um, there might well be something general we could say. We could, for instance, uh, we think so with this analysis and a bit of theory, we think that probably better nutritional knowledge for someone who holds the child's welfare is paramount, who <laughs> procures the food, who distributes the food, right? <laughs> and who also has the sufficient resources. Um, that that educating that kind of a person uh, will uh, improve childhood nutrition. The problem was that in Tamil Nadu, you were educating mothers, and mothers satisfied that more abstract description, and they did. Mothers did satisfy the more abstract description in Bangladesh. So there was something you could have learned from, if only you had the right conceptual tools, you would develop the right theoretical concepts. There was something general you could learn from the Tamil Nadu uh, um, study, but we didn't know, we didn't know what it was, right? We didn't know, I sometimes say, we didn't know what we were learning, right? We didn't know how to express our study results there. Now, it doesn't mean that all study results do have some correct generalization, but that, anyway, that's the short story. Um, now, um, I, I've begun this work because of, of the RCT movement in development economics. Uh, or, uh, for instance, uh, the MIT economist, you've probably have heard of her because there's that famous book now by uh, Duflo and Banerjee on poor economics. And um, if you look for low hanging fruit, they say, um, so maybe you can't have big um, development projects, um, but you 
can do things like distribute bed nets and you can, that, that will improve. RCTs will show whether they will improve um, uh, economic and other uh, results. But so Duflo says the past few years have seen a veritable explosion of randomized experiments in development economics, creating a color in which, culture in which rigorous randomized evaluations are promoted, encouraged, and financed has the potential to revolutionize social policy during the 21st century. Well, um, that would be wonderful if it were true. And um, so I only, <laughs> I only give this talk because I don't think it is true, and I don't want there to be a backlash against using RCTs or using uh, social science information to make a better policy because we've overpromised and overbid our cards, and then when it doesn't work, um, when I have heard that people in uh, Whitehall say, um, never want to talk to another scientist again. I mean, that, <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, Evidence-based policy doesn't work. So there is Esther Duflo and uh, Banerjee and a couple of other uh, economists uh, who do this kind of thing, Josh Angers and Steve Kishke. Um, here, for instance, is a case of, so you do an RCT in Tamil Nadu, and you generalize to Bangladesh, or you generalize to the world. You learn something about whether people do or do not use bed nets, whether they'll use bed nets if you give them to them for free, or they, there are different economic theories given to them for free, or um, whether they'll value them more, use them in the right ways of action. Pay a little bit for them, you think you learn something about that in a study, and then generalize. So here's a case of serious extrapolation. Uh, in a pioneering effort to improve welfare, the Progressive Program in Mexico offered cash transfers to randomly selected mothers contingent on participation in prenatal care, etc. Progressa is why this program, right, that I was RCT to say, RCT in uh, Mexico, this program is why now 30 countries worldwide have traditional class transfer communities. So that's serious extrapolation from particular settings in one place to another. Um, here's another. Deworm the world. <laughs> so there are studies. <laughs> study results in populations that the uh children increases um, school uh, school outcomes and the little theory is that they've got worms they're sick they don't come to school um, and you deworm them and they go to school and then they learn right? um, and this is a world we do we deworm the world that's a really big movement now and we know that that's and they don't you do it in a silly way, but look at the slogan, do in the world. Well, you know, my granddaughter was having trouble in her feet pain school in Oxford, and I tried deworming her, but it just hasn't, <laughs> hasn't done any good. Okay. So, um, all of this is to say, look, um, being a philosopher, um, I, I would normally encourage being careful about what we say. You know, philosophers are always saying, well, you know, is that, is that exactly what you meant? Say exactly what you mean? Um, but I think it really matters in cases like this. And so I want to distinguish three different kinds of causal claims that I think make a difference in, in this discourse on evidence-based policy. Um, and they're not traditional philosophical distinctions of kinds of causal claims. They're ones I've uh, kind of eked out <laughs> as I think matter in this discourse. One is it works somewhere claims. The policy produces the outcome somewhere, for example, in that study population there in Mexico City um, or in a village uh, in uh, Kenya. General claims, I call them Roman claims. You'll see why the policy produces the outcome widely or everywhere. Um, they're all over now we have this expression, it works. And as far as I can, I don't know what it works is supposed to mean. Uh, uh, but it seems to me it means something like it works everywhere, it works generally, you can take it as a default position that it will work, um, but you know it certainly isn't the same as claiming that it worked in some particular population where we've got pretty good evidence that it's worked. And then it will work here, it claims, the policy will produce the outcome here. So I'm keen to keep them distinguished. Um, sloppy talk, not distinguishing them, here's, uh, and I, I wasn't data mining, I wasn't looking for claims like this, just reading the literature uh, here in the second paragraph of a paper. The benefits of knowing which programs work extend far beyond any programs or agency and credible impact evaluations can impact your agency. And credible impact evaluations can offer reliable guidance. So I think that we have all three senses, uh, three distinct kinds of causal claims here, just sliding from one into the other 
without note or without mention, and almost as if it didn't make any difference, or I mean, it just sounds as if it doesn't make any difference at all. Now, my claim is that quite contrary to that nice, easy slide they had uh, from one to the other, um, it's a long and tortuous road from it works somewhere to it will work here. And there's a lot of rigor being put into establishing it works somewhere, and I want to insist that that's a huge waste um, and a false promise if uh, you know a chain uh, a chain of inference is only a chain's only as strong as its weakest link and a chain of inference is only as strong as its weakest step and if you can be very you know you can front load a lot of rigor and the first two or three um, stages in, a, in, in an argument that it'll work here but if if the rest of this is just done by a wink and a glance, right? Uh, it, it, there wasn't a lot of point in the original rigor. We need to uh, try to understand how you do get from it works somewhere to it will work here, and where the weak points in that inference will be, um, so we can figure out how trustworthy our final results should be. And I mean, they won't be very trustworthy. I mean, getting the other kinds of information is just more difficult than doing an RCT. Um, and it requires more imagination, and it's more controversial, so it won't be nearly as sure. We want to know, it'd be nice to know how sure we should be. Uh, uh, that there are all these dicey steps in between, how much should you hedge your bets in the end, and what kind of information should you look for. Okay. So, I think there are two essentials for building this road from it works somewhere to it will work here. So this is a start towards some rigor. I think I can prove there are two essential steps. I do it at a very abstract level, so not actually a lot of help to real people <laughs> trying to build a road from it works somewhere uh, to it will work here. But at least um, I think you know, it's a start to have isolated um, two necessary and sufficient conditions. One is what I call Roman laws. Um, so what you need is something like causal principles that hold widely, or at least um, they have to be wide enough to cover both the study population and the target population. So if you've got a study population and a target population that are governed by very different causal, causal laws, right, then there's no hope that learning the causal laws in the study population are going to uh, talk teach you about the target population. I use the term causal laws. You should use what word you want. But look, if you think there's some point in doing studies to make predictions, you have to be committed to some kind of systematic connection between the causes and the effects. So I mean, I use the word causal law for that. I mean, there are some, you know, if you've got a population and you really think that in this population, um, on average, nutritional information for the mothers um, is going to improve um, the, the nutrition of the children, that you must be assuming that there's some systematic connections uh, by which that's happening in the world. It's not just an accident, and if it were an accident, you couldn't really make the predictions. So um, I, I, I just start out with the assumption that there's a, some, kind of, some kind of thing such as a causal principle at work or a causal law at work. It can be very local. In fact, I think they are generally very local. That's the problem with them uh, to a population or a particular situation. Uh, but they can be as local as, you know, uh, it, they can be local to my toaster. Press the lever of my toaster, and I put, br br put bread in and it's plugged in. I press the lever and I get my toast. But if I press the lever on my toilet, the toilet flushes. If I press the lever on the floor of my car, I accelerate. So <laughs> those are all very local causal principles, but they're also, um, they are, you know, there's a, in each case, there's a systematic connection between the cause and the effect. And that, that, you know, the fact that is um, what's reflected in the causal law. So I think you need, um, you may not need universal laws, uh, but they better not be like the toaster and the toilet, where you've just got totally different causal laws about what happens when you press the handle. The other thing you need is the right support team. So you need all those factors without which the policy cannot act. So I'm going to explain both of these uh, necessary ingredients for going from uh, work there to work here. So causal principles for a study population. Suppose now I'm going to represent the outcomes um, by the random variable y. And suppose that they're determined by a causal principle that looks like this. Um, apart from the fact that the, this is linear, um, it's about as general as you. x is going to be our, sorry, I was 
I brought this so that <laughs> I could use the pointer, but x is our x represents our policy of interest. It could be a yes/no variable. You know, give nutrition, nutritional education, or don't. Um, uh, U is a unit in the study in, in the population that the causal principle holds for. Could be a very small population. There might be a causal principle that just applies to me. Could be a causal principle that applies to toasters. Could be a causal, causal principle that applies to anything. Um, so the use range over the units where the causal principle holds, and this is just the relationship by which you know, the size of the effect is, is produced. And the, and, and the question we want to know is, is there an X really in this equation? I mean, if X is our policy variable, is it really among the causes? Um, there'll be, there might be millions of causes. Okay, there are only two kinds that matter. I'm going to talk about these guys, the ones that cooperate with X. That actually work together with X to, to create a contribution, and all the rest. So these are interactive factors, <coughs> technically, and these are uh, additive factors. The reason I'm going to talk about these is because when you do an RCT, which is where we're starting in this particular discussion, when you do an RCT, um, these, if if in fact in an RCT you try to distribute uh, the randomization in the treatment and control groups is <coughs> supposed to distribute all yeah, what you're aiming for is all other causally relevant factors other than the treatment are identically distributed in two groups. That's not going to happen, but that's what you're aiming for. So the only difference between the two groups is the treatment, and if you get more positive outcomes in the treatment group than the control, oh, it must be the treatment that it, because there's no other causally relevant differences. Okay. Um, it turns out that the results, that just a bit of algebra, uh, just a bit of algebra will show that the results in an RCT, say the effect size, the difference between uh, the average effect in the treatment group and the control group, that that is a function of whatever factors are represented here. There will be a function beta, and these just drop out. So. There may or may not be a million other factors, but we don't see, they don't affect the results in an RCT. What matters is that these do, so we don't need So what you see in a, 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 a what you measure uh, as a, you, this, a kind of, an uh, effect size, what you're looking for, what people get concerned about in an RCT is an effect size. So, um, and the simplest one is you look at the average value of the, the, um, the effect given that the, the treatment was applied minus the average value of the effect in the control group given some other uh, value of x. Um, so the expectation, that's the um, average effect uh, individual effect is the difference between the average Y in the study group and the average Y in the control group. So what? Okay, so what's so important about this difference in average? Well, you don't want to hear all of that. I'm just going to give you the final result. If you do a little algebra, uh, assuming that you had an ideal RCT that distributed all the other factors evenly between the two groups, you could show that the average effect size is simply the difference in the value of the treatment between the treatment and control group times the average of that beta <laughs> that was there. The beta's not there. Okay. So, okay. So if the oh, this should have an expectation. If the average of t is greater than zero, that means remember back here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, here we are. If if the, if this quantity is bigger than zero, this has to be. So that means that x is really there. I mean, x really is in this equation because it makes a difference. Right? And um, that you know that beta was bigger than zero for some units in the study population. That's what you see. I mean, this is the actual quantity that you see, and that's what it amounts to. So you get two pieces of information, right? that the, the treatment really is uh, causally active, in the study population, and that beta is bigger than zero. So, and and the size of this depends on the average value of beta. So, let's try and figure out what beta means. <laughs> um, 
So I say, I um, mean, I just put another language, this means the policy plays a positive causal role, and it's actually there on the equation in that study population, and uh, the requisite support factors, which is what beta represents, are there. And then, not surprisingly, the policy is not going to work in the target unless, or it might be an accident that it does, but this is absolutely not relevant, the study is not relevant to, um, if the study and the target laws share, share this causal role. They don't share the causal role. It didn't do you any good to learn well, that it played a positive causal role in the target and in, in the study. And also that some, and it won't work. I mean, even if the, even if in the target, the policy is capable of playing. I mean, it would play a causal, causal, positive causal role if only some units had the right values of beta, but none of them have it. Then uh, you you won't get the um, you won't get positive results in the target. And that's matter again, let's think about beta because after all, maybe even if some units, no units have beta, maybe you can get them. But, or maybe you can notice that there's no way that anybody in this population is ever going to have the right value of beta. So, and why bother? So let's think about beta. Uh, here are um, my <laughs> example from uh, Harris School. Uh, Harris Cooper on homework. Um, so a um, lot of studies uh, indicate a uh, lot of studies in the studies homework improves a variety of outcomes. Uh, but if you look into it in more detail, um, then and so here's an, ed an educationalist of theory. He says, well, homework won't produce the expected um, improvement in the scores um, unless there's a whole team of support factors that it interacts with. If, if those are missing, you just homework can help, but it can't help if it doesn't have the support factors there. I mean, if you really don't have um, any work feedback or consistent lessons, um, you get nothing like the expected results from homework. Um, so again, homework isn't a yes/no. So it's not that if they're missing, you know, <laughs> you get less. Right? You just, when they're missing, you get you get quite a lot less. Um, so. Um, there are other conditions that are necessary with homework. Right? They, you know, they how, how much of them is present affects how much homework can actually contribute. So that's why they're called interactive. They're the support factors for homework. 20 minutes? 20 minutes. 20? Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, well, I asked if there were philosophers. Um, if you study causality, you might have studied J. L. Ma the Oxford philosopher J. L. Mackey, who says that causes are inus conditions. Um, and that's all that we're seeing here. So I mean, people who aren't philosophers, this is just another language for saying what I've been saying about support factors, but I do want to connect it up with uh, you know, <laughs> uh, more familiar philosophic territory. So an uh, inus condition is an insufficient but necessary part of an unnecessary but sufficient condition. <laughs> okay. um, this means, look, um, homework and all of its, that whole circle of factors are sufficient for making a contrib positive contribution to reading scores. The whole set of factors are sufficient. So um, homework is a part of a sufficient condition. Um, but, and it's a necessary part. Take the homework away and the other ones aren't enough by themselves. So it's a necessary part of a sufficient condition. But in general, that sufficient condition for getting an improvement in reading scores, you know, all that set of helping factors, it's not, that condition isn't necessary for getting improvement in reading scores. Look, if there's no way to, to get those helping factors, so you're not gonna bother with homework, there are other ways you can improve uh, students' reading scores or their math scores. You can have after school clubs, you can have Saturday morning clubs, you can give more feedback in class. There are a whole lot of other options. So circles, <laughs> circles with homework in them are not are um, unnecessary. So oopsie. So um, uh, so uh, so homework is not sufficient by itself. It's an insufficient part. It needs all those other helping factors, but it's a necessary part of that circle, and that circle is itself not necessary, because you can get improvements other ways, but it's sufficient for an improvement. Okay, so <laughs> all this is to 
say that the story about you know, people who've done with standard philosophy, this is, this is uh, well known to you. It's just that causes are minus conditions. We always use the example that striking a match is a good way to get a flame, but it needs oxygen in the room. Um, and it needs not to have a lot of uh, desperate fire, firemen around who, as soon as they see with a match in your hands, uh, spray it with water. So those are all um, minus conditions. And I'll just say as an aside to philosophers, um, that uh, the claim is that causes are minus conditions, but not that every ionis condition is a cause. And um, that's because um, ionis conditions are, in a sense, correlates. Uh, and you might think that all causes are, in some sense, correlated with their effects, but not everything that's correlated uh, with, a cause, uh, with a factor is a, is, is a cause. So that's an aside. We get all, all of that's an aside. Um, so you probably have learned that there were problems with the INIS condition analysis of causation. That's true. Right? But the problems go from assuming that everything that's an INIS condition is a cause, not from assuming that every cause is an INIS condition. OK, so that's the story about uh, needing, to, uh, needing to have the right support factors. The actual effect size you see in the experiment is a function of the distribution of the support factors. So we have, it depends on what the support factors are and how they're distributed in that population. If you think you're going to get the same effect size in another population, you better bet that you're going to have something like the same distribution of support factors there, because it's a function. It's an immediate rate function of it. Um, you also don't remember. Okay, so that was that's the first lesson. The other is I claim it doesn't help. Um, uh, if you don't have the same causal laws operating in the two. So I want to talk a little bit about shared causal laws, which is the Roman law problem. Um, um, there are problems with causal laws. Most of the causal laws that we rely on in these policy settings are both fragile and local. So fragile means that they break readily, often, some of them can break readily when we try to use them, and local means that they are not only locally, I've already illustrated that with the Tamil Nadu Bangladesh case, and um, with the uh, toaster in the toilet and the car. So, fragility. It's easy to break a causal principle. Here's one I cried over so often when I was a child, <laughs> is that you wind up the toy soldier to cause him to march, and then um, you wind them too tightly, the very thing you do, you know, you, in, you, 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 you make sure the cause is present, wind them up, and you wind it too tightly and it just breaks the mechanism. Um, notice the word mechanism. So there is a philosophical use of mechanism now um, that uh, is the one I'm relying on here, where the mechanism is the underlying structure that affords one of these local causal principles. So my toaster has a very different underlying structure than my toilet, and that's the reason why <laughs> my toaster affords the causal principle pressing the lever produces toast, and my toilet cistern affords the causal principle pressing the lever flushes the toilet, and my car <laughs> affords the causal principle uh, stepping on the throttle causes the car to accelerate. Stepping on the lever causes. Okay. So um, they, uh, they're, uh, it's, but the thing is, there's this underlying uh, structure. And that's what you see in the toy soldier. And you have to be careful that when you jiggle the cause to get the effect, you don't break the structure. So um, I don't really believe any of this work of Robert Lucas. Uh, but um, he, Robert Lucas, Nobel Prize winning Chicago School economist, who said, don't do policy. Don't do policy because um, you know, you get some of these, he didn't use the word, but you get some of these fragile uh, causal laws. They depend on the underlying socioeconomic structure. As soon as the government wants to use these causal laws as handles to, you know, to, uh, to affect change, um, they, you turn out to break the underlying causal structure. So, um, attempts to use established causal principles to intervene, the argument are likely to fail because the interventions are likely to destroy the very causal regularities you're depending on um, by changing the underlying structure of behaviors giving rise to them. So he has some models in which um, he um, looks at a surface causal principle, like um, in the medium run or short run, um, uh, the 
rising inflation lowers unemployment. It's a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And, it's, and, and in fact, in his model, that's a true causal principle. I mean, that actually is the case that the rising inflation is causing um, lowered unemployment. Uh, but what he does in his model, he's got a model that says, oh, why does that causal principle hold? Well, it, it holds on a kind of how rational agents and entrepreneurs and workers are all interacting. And uh, what's happening uh, when the government's not acting, uh, pulling the lever the inflation level, is, uh, this is the short version of the story, in the model, uh, um, the entrepreneurs are mistaking the rise in prices, which is in the inflationary rise in prices, they're mistaking it for a rise in price in their domain. So they think, oh, I can sell things for a higher price now, it's worth ma making more of them, so let's hire some workers to make more of them. That's because they don't know what, I mean, the, you know, when inflation is just happening naturally, uh, nobody's got a good enough grip on it to, to know what's happening, to see that it's really inflation. Uh, but when, when, when the government <laughs> is controlling inflation, everybody can see that it's, in, that it's just inflation. It's, you know, all the prices are going up, just not the prices for my good. So uh, the government breaks the underlying structural relations that are going on in the first place that afforded that puzzle of law. That's what we said. And that's what he, he's got models, but if the models are right, then you know he proves that. Um, but you know, so I mean it's nice because it makes this distinction between the underlying causal structure. I mean, he describes the underlying economic relations and interactions, and he shows that under one condition you can just arrive that if all those interactions are going on, you get a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And if um, if the government is pulling this handle, <laughs> then uh, it, 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 you can't derive that law. So, they're fragile. They're local. My favorite example <laughs> is not the Tamil Nadu of Bangladesh one, which is kind of horrible. Um, uh, I mean, sad, uh, because um, Bangladesh was really optimistic about this. Yes, but this is, <laughs> I sharpen my pencils uh, by flying a kite. And it's a really solid uh, causal connection. And it would pass any number of RCTs. Now, I can do that. I don't recommend you do it. I can do it because this is my study. Um, it's, you know, um, it's, it has this very funny underlying uh, structural design. Uh, which gives rise to this very funny, very, very local causal law. Now, you could, of course, get yourself <laughs> an underlying mechanism like this, and then you too you know, have a very good policy of sharpening your pencils by flying kites. Uh, but without this underlying causal structure, I mean, that causal law is very local. Uh, but my point is that almost all of the causal laws that we use uh, and would rely on, in particular, the kind that Dutho and J. Powell are finding out in uh, the causal laws uh, in, uh, in their RCT study populations are the kind that, if you had to bet, I bet they were very local. Uh, I mean, I know that they depend on underlying social structures because they're not God-given. They, they have to be afforded by something, and they are afforded by the underlying social structure. And if you know nothing about the underlying social structure, you're just winging it and expecting it will work somewhere else. Now, I don't want to say that you know, the fact that it's worked somewhere right, might be some reason. I mean, if you've got no idea what to do, well, try something that's worked somewhere, even if you haven't, but I wouldn't. You know, then don't get, don't oversell it. <laughs> Hedge your bets and do what you can to, okay, so locality. So what went wrong in Bangladesh? Sorry, I already told, gave you the punchline here. Uh, the causal principle relied on, the causal principle that was relied on, the very causal principle that had been shown to hold in Tamil Nadu, that causal principle did not reach to Bangladesh. And there were these two problems, man and mothers-in-law. So we already told you this story. This is hard right. It's just me. He's, this is just quoting right, the story I told you. Um, so, the integrated nutrition program, I just want to repeat what I said at the beginning. Now we've got a case of what would be a Roman law versus a legal law. And the false supposition was that Bangladesh shares this particular causal principle of Tamil Nadu. Better nutritional knowledge and mothers improves nutritional status in their children. Okay, that was 
the assumption about that being a, a transportable causal principle. That, but it turns out, God knows, it's a local law held in uh, the Indian states, but not in Bangladesh. So, conclusions. RCTs <coughs> may be gold standard for establishing it works somewhere, because they can provide a solid departure point. And if you can do it with RCT very well, um, I'm happy that it gives pretty good evidence uh, that the policy, the treatment, caused the targeted effect in the study population. I mean, you never know how good your RCT is, and the, but sometimes you can actually see big flaws in them. <laughs> but even if it's done on a huge population and done very well, you're, you, know, you, 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 you never know. Um, but still, you know, you're, you're, you've done a lot towards uh, getting good evidence that it works somewhere. So RTCTs can be a, a, a good standard, at least, for establishing it works somewhere. Because they, and if you're uh, wanting to find out whether it works here, that might be a starting point. Um, it, you know, uh, one of the people who's uh, been opposed to uh, all this emphasis on medical testing on, say, women, we're <laughs> ignored minority, <laughs> um, mo medical tests tending to be done on men, say, um, says, well, let, let, let's just find out. It would be wonderful if we could find out it worked on anyone <laughs> before we start worrying about who it works on. So maybe this is a starting point. Um, but you can't pave the long road from it works here with gold bricks. I mean, RCTs aren't going to tell you the other two things you need to know, which is that your target population is governed by the same causal principle, and that the requisite support factors are distributed in the right way in your target population. So conclusion two, to get from there to here, you need Roman laws or shared causal law. As I said, they don't have to hold everywhere, but they do have to hold at least <laughs> in your population. And you know, so it could be that your populations are really very uh, underlying structures, very identical, um, uh, or it could be that um, it's one of those few kinds of causal principles that just are shared across all all humanity. <laughs> but if you're going to get from there to here, you better uh, you, you do you just need uh, a law that's Roman enough, and you need the right support team. So. And part of the point is that once you know what you need, you can hunt for it. I mean, there's not such a nice methodology for trying to figure out what the underlying social structure is that affords a, um, a, a, a particular causal principle. But once you've got the idea, you can begin to investigate. I mean, after all, Lucas did it, right? And we can do it. Um, and uh, often you can find it. And that's just what Howard White did. I mean, it's a little too late. Right? Uh, in the Bangladesh case, identification of the mother-in-law effect came from reading anthropological, means ethnographic literature. <laughs> this insight led us to unpack the household. But then he went back. I mean, he got this insight from ethnographics. And of course, he's a kind of hard-nosed RCT uh, quantitative guy. So <laughs> he didn't really trust the ethnographic. Well, of course, he shouldn't have. I mean, you get all the evidence you can. Um, so he went back and he looked at, he said, we let us unpack the household roster section of the questionnaire to identify those women living with their mothers in law. And then it turned out that the ones living with their mothers in law were predominantly the ones where it didn't work. Um, now, the problem is that you may not be encouraged to look because of the idolatry of methods that, at the moment, um, there's such a big push, uh, as we saw for, and say, Jagpal and, uh, and in here in the UK, we're investing in um, uh, six new what work centres, mm -hmm. huge investment, two million, two hundred million pounds, um, and the what work centres are essentially going to vet RCTs. Uh, so, um, and they're not, unfortunately thinking about how to get uh, what little information you might be able to get on these other two items that you need to know to figure out whether they'll work here. So conclusion three, getting policy right is hard, but it's even harder if you insist on using only one tool, the RCT. So there. <laughs> Thank you.